this week's Grim Fairy Tales, Tom Thumb, Journeyman. A certain tailor had a son who happened to be small and no bigger than a thumb. And on this account, he was always called Tom Thumb. He had, however, some courage in him and said to his father, Father, I must and will go out into the world. That's right, my son, said the old man, and took a long darning needle and made a knob of sealing wax on it at the candle. And there is your sword for thee to take with thee on the way. Then the little tailor went to have one more meal with them and hopped into the kitchen to see what his lady mother had cooked for the last time. It was, however, just dished up, and the dish stood on the hearth. Then he said, Mother, what is there to eat today? See for thyself, said his mother. So Tom Thumb jumped on the hearth and peeped into the dish. But as he stretched his neck in too far, the steam from the food caught hold of him and carried him up the chimney. He rode about in the air on the steam for a while, until at length he sank down to the ground again. Now the little tailor was outside in the wide world, and he traveled about and went to a master in his craft, but the food was not good enough for him. Mistress, if you give us no better food, said Tom Thumb, I will go away and early tomorrow morning I will write with chalk on the door of your house. Too many potatoes, too little meat. Farewell, Mr. Potato King. What wouldst thou have forsooth, Grasshopper? said the mistress, and grew angry, and seized a dishcloth, and was just going to strike him. But my little tailor crept nimbly under a thimble, peeped out from beneath it and put his tongue out at the mistress. She took up the thimble and wanted to get hold of him, but little Tom Thumb hopped into the cloth, and while the mistress was opening it out and looking for him, he got into a crevice in the table. Ho, ho, lady mistress, cried he, and thrust his head out, and when she began to strike him, he leapt down into the drawer. At last, however, she caught him and drove him out of the house. The little tailor journeyed on and came to a great forest, and there he fell in with a band of robbers who had a design to steal the king's treasure. When they saw the little tailor, they thought, A little fellow like that can creep through a keyhole and serve as picklock to us. Oh, cried one of them. Thou giant Goliath, wilt thou go to the treasure chamber with us? Thou canst slip thyself in and throw out the money. Tom Thumb reflected a while, and at length he said, Yes, and went with them to the treasure chamber. Then he looked at the doors above and below to see if there was any crack in them. It was not long before he espied one which was broad enough to let him in. He was therefore about to get in at once, but one of the two sentries who stood before the door observed him and said to the other, What an ugly spider is creeping there. I will kill it. Let the poor creature alone, said the other. It has done thee no harm. Then Tom Thumb got safely through the crevice into the treasure chamber, opened the window beneath which the robbers were standing, and threw out to them one taller after another. When the little tailor was in the full swing of his work, he heard the king coming to inspect his treasure chamber and crept hastily into a hiding place. The king noticed that several solid tallers were missing, but could not conceive who could have stolen them, 
for locks and bolts were in good condition, and all seemed well guarded. Then he went away again and said to the sentries, Be on the watch, someone is after the money. When therefore Tom Thumb recommenced his labors, they heard the money moving and a sound of clink, clink, clink. They ran swiftly in to seize the thief, but the little tailor who heard them coming was still swifter and leapt into a corner and covered himself with a taller so that nothing could be seen of him, and at the same time, he mocked the sentries and cried, Here I am! The sentries ran thither, but as they got there, he had already hopped into another corner under a taller, and was crying, Ho ho, here am I! The watchman sprang there in haste, but Tom Thumb had long ago got into a third corner, and was crying, Ho, ho, am I? And thus he made fools of them, and drove them so long round about the treasure chamber that they were weary and went away. Then by degrees he threw all the tallers out, dispatching the last with all his might, then hopped nimbly upon it and flew down with it through the window. The robbers paid him great compliments, Thou art a valiant hero, said they. Wilt thou be our captain? Tom Thumb, however, declined and said he wanted to see the world first. They now divided the booty, but the little tailor only asked for a kreutzer because he could not carry more. Then he once more buckled on his sword, bade the robbers goodbye, and took to the road. First, he went to work with some masters, but he had no liking for that, and at last he hired himself as manservant in an inn. The maids, however, could not endure him, for he saw all they did secretly without their seeing him, and he told their master and mistress what they had taken off the plates and carried away out of the cellar for themselves. Then said they, Wait! and we will pay thee off." And arranged with each other to play him a trick. Soon afterwards, when one of the maids was mowing in the garden, and saw Tom Thumb jumping about and creeping up and down the plants, she mowed him up quickly with the grass, tied all in a great cloth, and secretly threw it to the cows. Now amongst them, there was a great black one, who swallowed him down without hurting him. Down below, however, it pleased him ill, for it was quite dark, neither was any candle burning. When the cow was being milked, he cried, Strip, strap, straw! Will pale soon be full? But the noise of the milking prevented his being understood. After this, the master of the house came into the cow buyer and said, That cow shall be killed tomorrow. Then Tom Thumb was so alarmed that he cried out in a clear voice, Let me out first, for I am shut up inside her. The master heard that quite well, but did not know from whence the voice came. Where art thou? asked he. In the black one, answered Tom Thumb, but the master did not understand what that meant, and went out. Next morning the cow was killed. Happily, Tom Thumb did not meet with one blow of the cutting up and chopping. He got among the sausage meat, and when the butcher came in and began his work, he cried out with all his might, Don't chop too deep! Don't chop too deep! I am amongst it! No one heard this because of the noise of the chopping knife. Now poor Tom Thumb was in trouble, but trouble sharpens the wits and he sprang out so adroitly between the blows that none of them touched him, and he escaped with a whole skin. But still, he could not get away. There was nothing for it but to let himself be thrust into a black pudding with the bits of bacon. His quarters there were rather confined, and besides that, 
he was hung up in the chimney to be smoked, and their time did hang terribly heavy on his hands. At length in winter, he was taken down again, as the black pudding had to be set before a guest. When the hostess was cutting it in slices, he took care not to stretch out his head too far, lest a bit of it should be cut off. At last he saw his opportunity, cleared a passage for himself and jumped out. The little tailor, however, would not stay any longer in a house where he fared so ill. So at once he set out on his journey again, but his liberty did not last long. In the open country he met with a fox who snapped him up in a fit of absence. Hello, Mr. Fox, cried the little tailor. It is I who am sticking in your throat. Set me at liberty again. Thou art right, answered the fox. Thou art next to nothing for me. But if thou wilt promise me the fowls in thy father's yard, I will let thee go. With all my heart, replied Tom Thumb. Thou shalt have all the cocks and hens, and I promise thee. Then the fox let him go again, and himself carried him home. When the father once more saw his dear son, he willingly gave the fox all the fowls which he had. For this I likewise bring thee a handsome bit of money, said Tom Thumb, and gave his father the kreutzer which he earned on his travels. But why did the fox get the poor chickens to eat? Oh, you goose, your father would surely love his child far more than the fowls in the yard. Sweet Porridge There was a poor but good little girl who lived alone with her mother and they no longer had anything to eat. So the child went into the forest, and there an aged woman met her, who was aware of her sorrow, and presented her with a little pot, which when she said, Cook, little pot, cook, would cook good, sweet porridge. And when she said, Stop, little pot, it ceased to cook. The girl took the pot home to her mother, and now they were freed from their poverty and hunger, and ate sweet porridge as often as they chose. Once on a time, when the girl had gone out, her mother said, Cook, little pot, cook. And it did cook, and she ate till she was satisfied, and then she wanted the pot to stop cooking, but did not know the word. So it went on cooking, and the porridge rose over the edge, and still it cooked on until the kitchen and whole house were full, and then the next house, and then the whole street, just as if it wanted to satisfy the hunger of the whole world. And there was the greatest distress, but no one knew how to stop it. At last, when only one single house remained, the child came home and just said, Stop, little pot. And it stopped and gave up cooking. And whosoever wished to return to the town had to eat his way back. The Young Giant Once on a time, a countryman had a son who was as big as a thumb and did not become any bigger and during several years did not grow one hair's breadth. Once when the father was going out to plow, the little one said, Father, I will go out with you. Thou wouldst go out with me? said the father. Stay here, thou wilt be of no use out there. Besides, thou mightest get lost. Then Tom Thumb began to cry, and for the sake of peace, his father put him in his pocket and took him with him. When he was outside in the field, he took him out again, 
and set him in a freshly cut furrow. Whilst he was there, a great giant came over the hill. Do thou see that great bogey? said the father, for he wanted to frighten the little fella to make him good. He is coming to fetch thee. The giant, however, had scarcely taken two steps with his long legs before he was in the furrow. He took up little Tom Thumb carefully with two fingers, examined him, and without saying one word, went away with him. His father stood by, but could not utter a sound for terror, and he thought nothing else but that his child was lost, and that as long as he lived, he should never set eyes on him again. The giant, however, carried him home, suckled him, and Tom Thumb grew and became tall and strong after the manner of giants. When two years had passed, the old giant took him into the forest, wanted to try him, and said, Pull up a stick for thyself. Then the boy was already so strong that he tore up a young tree out of the earth by the roots. But the giant thought, we must do better than that. Took him back again and suckled him two years longer. When he tried him, his strength had increased so much that he could tear an old tree out of the ground. That was still not enough for the giant. He again suckled him for two years. And when he then went with him into the forest and said, Now, just tear up a proper stick for me. The boy tore up the strongest oak tree from the earth, so that it split, and that was a mere trifle to him. Now, that will do, said the giant. Thou art perfect, and took him back to the field from whence he had brought him. His father was there, following the plow, the young giant went up to him and said, Does my father see what a fine man his son has grown into? The father was alarmed and said, No, thou art not my son. I don't want thee. Leave me. Truly, I am your son. Allow me to do your work. I can plow as well as you. Nay, better. No, no, thou art not my son, and thou canst not plow. Go away. However, as he was afraid of this great man, he left go of the plow, stepped back, and stood at one side of the piece of land. Then the youth took the plow and just pressed it with one hand. But his grasp was so strong that the plow went deep into the earth. The farmer could not bear to see that, and called to him, If thou art determined to plow, thou must not press so hard on it. That makes bad work. The youth, however, unharnessed the horses and drew the plow himself, saying, Just go home, father, and bid my mother Make ready a large dish of food, and in the meantime, I will go over the field. Then the farmer went home, and ordered his wife to prepare the food. But the youth plowed the field, which was two acres large, quite alone, and then he harnessed himself to the harrow, and harrowed the whole of the land, using two harrows at once. When he had done it, he went into the forest and pulled up two oak trees, laid them across his shoulders, and hung on them one harrow behind and one before, and also one horse behind and one before, and carried it all as if it had been a bundle of straw to his parents' house. When he entered the yard, his mother did not recognize him and asked, Who? is that horrible tall man. The farmer said, That is our son. 
she said. No, that cannot be our son. We never had such a tall one. Ours was a little thing. She called to him. Go away. We do not want thee. The youth was silent, but led his horses to the stable, gave them some oats and hay and all that they wanted. When he had done this, he went into the parlor, sat down on the bench and said, Mother, now I should like something to eat. Will it soon be ready? Then she said, Yes, and brought in two immense dishes full of food, which would have been enough to satisfy herself and her husband for a week. The youth, however, ate the whole of it himself and asked if she had nothing more to set before him. No, she replied. That is all we have. But that was only a taste. I must have more. She did not dare to oppose him and went and put a huge cauldron full of food on the fire and when it was ready, carried it in. At length come a few crumbs, said he and ate all there was, but it was still not sufficient to appease his hunger. Then said he, Father, I see well that with you I shall never have food enough. If you will get me an iron staff which is strong and which I cannot break against my knees, I will go out into the world. The farmer was glad, put his two horses in his cart, and fetched from the smith a staff so large and thick that the two horses could only just bring it away. The youth laid it across his knees and snap, he broke it in two in the middle like a beanstalk and threw it away. The father then harnessed four horses and brought a bar which was so long and thick that the four horses could only just drag it. The son snapped this also in twain against his knees, threw it away and said, Father, this can be of no use to me. You must harness more horses and bring a stronger staff. So the father harnessed eight horses and brought one which was so long and thick that the eight horses could only just carry it. When the son took it in his hand, he broke off a bit from the top of it also and said, Father, I see that you will not be able to procure me any such staff as I want. I will remain no longer with you. So he went away and gave out that he was a smith's apprentice. He arrived at a village wherein lived a smith who was a greedy fellow who never did a kindness to anyone but wanted everything for himself. The youth went into the smithy and asked if he needed a journeyman. Yes, said the smith, and looked at him and thought, That is a strong fellow, lo who will strike out well and earn his bread. So he asked, How much wages dost thou want? I don't want any at all he replied. Only every fortnight, when the other journeymen are paid, I will give thee two blows, and thou must bear them. The misser was heartily satisfied, and thought he would thus save much money. Next morning, the strange journeyman was to begin to work, but when the master brought the glowing bar, and the youth struck his first blow, the iron flew asunder, and the anvil sank so deep into the earth that there was no bringing it out again. Then the misser grew angry and said, Oh, but I can't make any use of you. You strike far too powerfully. What will you have for the one blow? Then he said, I will only give you quite a small blow, that's all. And he raised his foot and gave him such a kick that he flew away over four loads of hay. Then he sought out the thickest iron bar in the smithy for himself, 
took it as a stick in his hand and went onwards. When he had walked for some time, he came to a small farm and asked the bailiff if he did not require a head servant. Yes, said the bailiff. I can make use of one. You look a strong fellow who can do something. How much a year do you want as wages? He again replied that he wanted no wages at all, but that every year he would give him three blows, which he must bear. Then the bailiff was satisfied, for he too was a covetous fellow. Next morning all the servants were to go into the wood, and the others were already up, but the head servant was still in bed. Then one of them called to him, Get up! It is time we are going into the wood, and thou must go with us. Ah, said he quite roughly and surly. You may just go then. I shall be back again before any of you. Then the others went to the bailiff and told him that the head man was still lying in bed and would not go into the wood with them. The bailiff said they were to awaken him again and tell him to harness the horses. The head man, however, said as before, Just go there. I shall be back again before any of you. And then he stayed in bed two hours longer. At length he arose from the feathers, but first he got himself two bushels of peas from the loft, made himself some broth with them, ate it at his leisure, and when that was done, went and harnessed the horses, and drove into the wood. Not far from the wood was a ravine through which he had to pass, so he first drove the horses on, and then stopped them, and went behind the cart, took trees and bushwood, and made a great barricade, so that no horse could get through. When he was entering the wood, the others were just driving out of it with their loaded carts to go home. Then said he to them, Drive on, I will still get home before you do. He did not drive far into the wood, but at once tore two of the very largest trees of all out of the earth, threw them on his cart, and turned round. When he came to the barricade, the others were still standing there, not able to get through. Don't you see, said he, that if you had stayed with me, you would have got home just as quickly, and would have had another hour's sleep. He now wanted to drive on, but his horses could not work their way through, so he unharnessed them, laid them on the top of the cart, took the shafts in his own hands, and pulled it all through. And he did this just as easily as if it had been laden with feathers. When he was over, he said to the others, there you see, I have got over quicker than you, and drove on, and the others had to stay where they were. In the yard, however, he took a tree in his hands, showed it to the bailiff, and said, Isn't that a fine bundle of wood? Then said the bailiff to his wife, The servant is a good one, if he does sleep long. He is still home before the others. So he served the bailiff for a year, and when that year was over, and the other servants were getting their wages, he said it was time for him to have his too. The bailiff, however, was afraid of the blows which he was to receive, and earnestly entreated him to excuse him from having them. For rather than that, he himself would be head servant, and the youth should be bailiff. No, said he, I will not be a bailiff. I am head servant, and will remain so, but I will administer that which we agreed on. The bailiff was willing to give him whatsoever he demanded, but it was of no use. The head servant said no to everything. Then the bailiff did not know what to do, and begged for a fortnight's delay, for he wanted to find some way of escape. The head servant consented to this delay, 
the bailiff summoned all his clerks together, and they were to think the matter over and give him advice. The clerks pondered for a long time, but at last they said that no one was sure of his life with the head servant, for he could kill a man as easily as a midge, and that the bailiff ought to make him get into the well and clean it, and when he was down below, they would roll up one of the millstones which was lying there and throw it on his head, and then he would never return to daylight. The advice pleased the bailiff, and the head servant was quite willing to go down the well. When he was standing down below at the bottom, they rolled down the largest millstone and thought they had broken his skull, but he cried, Chase away those hens from the well. They are scratching in the sand up there and throwing the grains into my eyes so that I can't see. So the bailiff cried, shh, shh, and pretended to frighten the hens away. When the head servant had finished his work, he climbed up and said, Just look what a beautiful necktie I have on. And behold, it was the millstone which he was wearing round his neck. The head servant now wanted to take his reward, but the bailiff again begged for a fortnight's delay. The clerks met together and advised him to send the head servant to the haunted mill to grind corn by night. For from thence, as yet no man had ever returned in the morning alive, the proposal pleased the bailiff. He called the head servant that very evening and ordered him to take eight bushels of corn to the mill and grind it that night for it was wanted. So the head servant went to the loft and put two bushels in his right pocket and two in his left and took four in a wallet, half on his back and half on his breast and thus laden went to the haunted mill. The miller told him that he could grind there very well by day, but not by night, for the mill was haunted, and that up to the present time, whosoever had gone into it at night had been found in the morning, lying dead inside. He said, I will manage it, just you go away to bed. Then he went into the mill and poured out the corn. About eleven o'clock he went into the miller's room and sat down on the bench. When he had sat there a while, a door suddenly opened and a large table came in and on the table wine and roasted meats placed themselves and much good food besides, but everything came of itself for no one was there to carry it. After this the chairs pushed themselves up but no people came until all at once he beheld fingers which handled knives and forks and laid food on the plates, but with this exception he saw nothing. As he was hungry, he saw the food. He too placed himself at the table, ate with those who were eating and enjoyed it. When he had enough and the others also had quite emptied their dishes, he distinctly heard all the candles being suddenly snuffed out, and as it was now pitch dark, he felt something like a box on the ear. Then he said, If anything of that kind comes again, I shall strike out in return. And when he received a second box on the ear, he too struck out, and so it continued the whole night. He took nothing without returning it, but repaid everything with interest, and did not lay about him in vain. At daybreak, however, everything ceased. When the miller had gotten up, he wanted to look after him, and wondered if he were still alive. Then the youth said, I have eaten my fill, have received some boxes on the ears, but I have given some in return. The miller rejoiced and said that the mill was now released from the spell and wanted to give him much money as a reward. But he said, Money I will not have. I have enough of it. 
So he took his meal on his back and went home and told the bailiff that he had done what he had been told to do and would now have the reward agreed on. When the bailiff heard that, he was seriously alarmed and quite beside himself. He walked backwards and forwards in the room and drops of perspiration ran down from his forehead. Then he opened the window to get some fresh air, but before he was aware, the head servant had given him such a kick that he flew through the window, out into the air, and so far away that no one ever saw him again. Then said the head servant to the bailiff's wife, If he does not come back, you must take the other blow. She cried, No, no, I cannot bear it, and opened the other window because drops of perspiration were running down her forehead. Then he gave her such a kick that she too flew out, and as she was lighter, she went much higher than her husband. Her husband cried, Do come to me. But she replied, Come thou to me, I cannot come to thee and they hovered about there in the air and could not get to each other and whether they are still hovering about or not I do not know but the young giant took up his iron bar and went on his way the elves part one a shoemaker by no fault of his own had become so poor that at last he had nothing left but leather for one pair of shoes. So in the evening, he cut out the shoes which he wished to begin to make the next morning. And as he had a good conscience, he lay down quietly in his bed, commended himself to God, and fell asleep. In the morning, after he had said his prayers, and was just going to sit down to work, the two shoes stood quite finished on his table. He was astounded and knew not what to say to it. He took the shoes in his hands to observe them closer and they were so neatly made that there was not one bad stitch in them, just as if they were intended as a masterpiece. Soon after too, a buyer came in and as the shoes pleased him so well, he paid more for them than was customary, and with the money, the shoemaker was able to purchase leather for two pairs of shoes. He cut them out at night, and next morning was about to set to work with fresh courage, but he had no need to do so, for when he got up, they were already made, and buyers also were not wanting, who gave him money enough to buy leather for four pairs of shoes. The following morning, too, he found the four pairs made, and so it went on constantly. What he cut out in the evening was finished by the morning, so that he soon had his honest independence again, and at last became a wealthy man. Now it befell that one evening not long before Christmas, when the man had been cutting out, he said to his wife, before going to bed, what do you think if we were to stay up tonight to see who it is that lends us this helping hand? The woman liked the idea and lighted a candle, and they hid themselves in a corner of the room behind some clothes which were hanging up there and watched. When it was midnight, two pretty little naked men came, sat down by the shoemaker's table, took all the work which was cut out before them and began to stitch and sew and hammer so skillfully and so quickly with their little fingers that the shoemaker could not turn away his eyes for astonishment. They did not stop until all was done and stood finished on the table and then they ran quickly away. Next morning the woman said, The little men have made us rich and we really must show that we are grateful for it. They run about so, and having nothing on, 
and must be cold. I'll tell thee what I'll do. I will make them little shirts and coats and vests and trousers, and knit both of them a pair of stockings, and do thou to make them two little pairs of shoes. The man said, I shall be very glad to do it. And one night, when everything was ready, they laid their presents all together on the table, instead of the cut-out work, and then concealed themselves to see how the little men would behave. At midnight they came bounding in, and wanted to get to work at once, but as they did not find any leather cut out, but only the pretty little articles of clothing, they were at first astonished, and then they showed intense delight. They dressed themselves with the greatest rapidity, putting the pretty clothes on and singing. Now we are boys so fine to see, why should we longer cobblers be? Then they danced and skipped and leapt over chairs and benches. At last they danced out of doors. From that time forth they came no more. But as long as the shoemaker lived, all went well with him and all his undertakings prospered. Part 2 There was once a poor servant girl who was industrious and cleanly and swept the house every day and emptied her sweepings on the great heap in front of the door. One morning, when she was just going back to her work, she found a letter on this heap, and as she could not read, she put her broom in the corner and took the letter to her master and mistress, and behold, it was an invitation from the elves, who asked the girl to hold a child for them at its christening. The girl did not know what to do, but at length, after much persuasion, and as they told her that it was not right to refuse an invitation of this kind, she consented. Then. Three elves came and conducted her to a hollow mountain, where the little folks lived. Everything there was small, but more elegant and beautiful than can be described. The baby's mother lay in a bed of black ebony ornamented with pearls. The cover lids were embroidered with gold. The cradle was of ivory and the bath of gold. The girl stood as godmother and then wanted to go home. But the little elves urgently entreated her to stay three days with them. So she stayed and passed the time in pleasure and gaiety. And the little folks did all they could to make her happy. At last she set out on her way home. Then first they filled her pockets quite full of money. And after that they led her out of the mountain again. When she got home, she wanted to begin her work, and took the broom, which was still standing in the corner, in her hand and began to sweep. Then some strangers came out of the house, who asked her who she was, and what business she had there. And she had not, as she thought, been three days with the little men in the mountains, but seven years, and in the meantime, her former masters had died. Part 3 A certain mother's child had been taken away out of its cradle by elves, and a changeling with a large head and staring eyes, which would do nothing but eat and drink, laid in its place. In her trouble, she went to her neighbor and asked her advice. The neighbor said that she was to carry the changeling into the kitchen, set it down on the hearth, light a fire and boil some water in two eggshells, which would make the changeling laugh, and if he laughed, all would be over with him. The woman did everything that her neighbor bade her. When she put the eggshells with water on the fire, the imp said, I am as old now as the Wester Forest, but never yet have I seen anyone boil anything in an eggshell and he began to laugh at it. Whilst he was laughing, suddenly came a host of little elves who brought the right child, set it down on the hearth, and took the changeling away with them.